thank God for our laymen on this evening leading us in our devotion. Let's praise God for them. Amen. Luke chapter 4. Verse 18. Jesus opened the book in the synagogue and read from what has been has come to be known as the book of Isaiah chapter 61 the spirit of the Lord yeah. right. is upon me yeah. because he hath anointed me yeah. to preach the gospel yeah. to the poor yeah. Yeah. amen Stop right there. We want to continue our study of the church evangelizing. Yes. Won't you repeat that after me this time? The church, the church. evangelizing. Yes. You may be seated. Yes. Serendipity <laughs> is not a plan. Serendipity is when things just come together yeah, yeah. without uh, any, seemingly without causation. That's not a plan. It's good when things do come together. Yeah. And I think sometimes in our spiritual language, we make it sound like it ought to be a plan. We're just going to wait on God. And when in, in his time, he's going to work it out. <laughs> but that's not a plan. Jesus reads and says, he has anointed me. He has set me apart to do something. If there's going to be ministry to the poor, mm. someone has to do something. Amen. It will not serendipitously happen. There has to be a strategic plan. Yes. And we talked on last week about the whole notion of our quest as being disciples of Christ First of all, to pursue righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But righteousness alone, in the way that we use that term, right standing with God, does not guarantee that we'll reach the laws. We can be right with God in relationship and still be ineffective in evangelism. And Jesus' commission to the church is to go into all the world and make disciples. So if we are not busy carrying out the commission, we are failing to carry out the mission. So if righteousness is our pursuit, saving money cannot be our priority. We're talking particularly as a Christian community that a church that's doing no ministry or very little of it but brags about how much money they have in the bank mm. has gotten off track. Right. Yeah. The church must use money to reach men. All right. A church that focuses on saving money will determine how much ministry it can do based upon how much it costs. 
And that's a symptom of a destructive desire. Walmart does not grow because it strives to save money. Amen. Amen. The fact of the matter is, is that we must view what we call money as a currency. As a currency, and it's a fiat currency at that. It's, it, it means that it really has no value. It only represents value. A dollar bill does not mean that you have a dollar worth of gold. It means you have a piece of paper with a dollar with a dollar sign on it, and it's backed by the U.S. government. And the more of it they print, the lower its value. So, if a currency is not moving, if it's not producing. It's dying. All right. So then, saving money is losing money because your savings account interest is not going to keep up with the cost of inflation. All right. All right. So if you're saving money, you're losing money. So then the idea is, how can I use money? Uh, Jesse Jackson was asked years ago, and I told you this before, when I Heard him say it then, I thought it was the dumbest statement. You know, it was, came from Jesse, so I wasn't going to say it, but I thought that was the dumbest statement. But I understand it now. He said, money does grow on trees if you plant it in money mud. All right. <laughs> Just depends on where you plant it. And so if you plant it in quicksand, it's dying. But if you plant it in soil that's fertile, it can produce. So then the church then, and, and this, this works from the local church to the universal church. It, it works from individuals who make up the church as well as the corporate body that makes up the church must develop self-regulating systems so that the systems will generate income and therefore the more income you regulate the more ministry you can do. Right. I've heard people say I don't need much money. I can just pay my bills. I'm happy. That's the portrait of a person whose vision is no bigger than their bills. And if that's as big as your vision is, then that's going to be as big as your goal. But if your vision is bigger, I want to reach the masses, then the more you get, the more you can do. But if you're trying to get all you can, can all you get, and then sit on the can, then you just want to pay your bills and stash some on the side and it feel good that you got some money for a rainy day. And sometimes you save it for a rainy day and you're in a storm. So the vision then dictates the mission. And the, one of the reasons why I remind us of our location is because our location demands that we have a vision that stretches beyond our community. If we only see this community, we're in trouble. Because there are not a whole lot of houses in this community, and even the residential areas that's being built are generally being occupied by people who don't look like us. So if we only think about this community, we're going to become a museum of what the church used to look like on the south side. Amen. Amen. You've got to think globally. Amen. All the world. We've got to think large. But if we think large, then we start saying, how can we meet the needs of those who aren't living in this area 
and how can we meet the needs of those who are right. living in this area. And the more we get, the more we can do. We are equipped already as a church. If we maximize what we have, we are equipped already to do the amazing. We buy assets. We use money to create relationships. We talked about that last week in Luke 16. And those relationships produce righteousness. So we've got dropout recovery. That means that we've got students who come here. We don't have to go look for them. They come here. So then, how do we reach those who are coming here? We have the VIP building. People who want to rent the VIP building. We don't have to look for them. They come here. So how do we reach those who come here? See, that's, those are the things you have to factor in when you look at costs. If you try, if you're focusing on money, then you will come, you will constantly raise up the cost so you can make as much money as you can. And you might weed out some folk in a certain economic group because you're raising up the cost. Well, the problem with that is now you're weeding out folk you could be ministering Amen. to. Amen. Summer camp. We don't have to go find those kids and their parents. They're coming here. So how do we reach those who are coming here? Companies who do work for the church, plumbing, AC, whatever it is, they're coming here. Now that you're here, how can we reach them? Neighbors, businesses right in the, area, in the neighborhood. Who are they? How do we reach them? The limousine service, people wanting to rent the limousine, and that's why it's important that everything we have, we take care of. Amen. Amen. So that when people come here to use those facilities, it's ministry for us. It brings in money, but it's not about the money. We want the money so we can do more of the ministry. Now. We donate to causes. And when we donate to causes, we're not only investing in what they are doing, we're also building relationships. Yeah. As, a, as a college HBCU in Alabama, that we've not given to. We've given to some schools, but we've not given to them. Got a letter from them today asking for churches to support. So that needs to be on our mission to include them in another college we develop a relationship with. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing the power that you have when you represent a group. And so when a group invests in another group, that group respects you because you are partnering with them. Amen. Now you're developing a relationship with them, and through the, that relationship, you can likewise develop righteousness. And so we use our assets, and we get as many assets as we can get. There are three types of assets. Three types of assets as it relates to to money, human assets, physical assets, and financial assets. Human assets deal with people. There are some things you don't need money for if you have somebody else to do it for you. Human asset. There are people who are gifted to do things, called to do certain things, and they're really looking for somebody to give them a chance to do it. Amen. I remember saying years ago, I guess I had good sense even then, <laughs> I said to a pastor who was several years older than me, probably 20 years older than me, 
He was frustrated at the church he was pastoring and getting ready to resign. I said, man, God don't do it. He said, no, I just can't take it. I said, look, man, you got a chance to preach every Sunday. If they don't follow your leadership, you ain't got to fight and argue, but preach. Yeah. He didn't take my advice. He resigned, and he ended up mad at a whole lot of pastors because they didn't invite him to their churches right. to preach. Mm -hmm. I said, you had one. Yeah. All right. Amen. Amen. You are called to preach. You got a place to preach. Use it. Yeah. And so if you have a person who has a gifting and a calling, they want to use that gift. Here's, here's something else that you may not know. There are millionaires who have learned so much, who are looking for somebody to pass their wisdom on to, but most folk won't listen. All right. And so if you really, one man puts it this way, he says, if I only had a few dollars and lost my job, most people would take their few dollars and buy a meal and bed. I would go to the most expensive restaurant I could find, get some coffee, and sit next to somebody who's got some business sense right. and ask for advice. Yeah. And people will give you advice for free. But most people aren't asking. Most people would say, well, they got millions. I ain't paying for no lunch for them. Let them pay for mine. And so they keep their money, eat their lunch, keep their wisdom, and you leave with nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have human assets who are all around us. That's one of the benefits of a group again. If we would just learn to say, let me start appreciating the human assets at this church. Yeah. I said to one of our members after church Sunday, I said, you are too gifted. We got to talk. I got to find something for you to do. Yeah. Too many gifts. And I don't want the secular world to get all your gifts. Yeah. 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 Human access. And sometimes what we do is we appreciate the gifts of the folk we don't know. Yeah. Man, I've been around so many people who are known nationally in various areas. And I learned from being around them, they have two legs just like me. Yeah. I suspect ten toes just like I do. And they put them on one, their pants on one leg at a time. And so oftentimes the people who we hold in highest regard just happen to be at the right place to get the right exposure. And we have someone right in our midst, just as gifted, but because the world had not told us they're gifted, we overlook the human asset. Physical assets. Those are those things that you possess, like a vehicle, a building, a lawnmower. Those are physical assets. I don't need the money to pay for a bus ticket if I have my own car. Amen. And so sometimes we end up minimizing the ministry we do because of money. And we're not utilizing the other assets we have, human and physical. Amen. And then financial assets, which is basically trading money for human and physical assets. Mm -hmm. And so when we recognize that there are three types of assets, and then there are three financial assets, business, paper, and real estate, so then when you start dealing with financial assets, how can you maximize it through those three assets? So you're constantly trying to get assets so that you can do more ministry. Yeah. I, I know that any person with real vision and commitment to, the, to that vision can do more ministry with $100,000 than 
and they can with 10. Amen. And so we looked at that passage, the love of money is the root of all evil, and we saw that that passage is not about money. It's about desire. Amen. That when, when you get distracted at the root of all the distractions as mentioned in that chapter, he says the root of it is their desire for wealth. Mm -hmm. Our desire is for spiritual wealth and building the kingdom and we will accept as much as many assets as we can get so that we can do more ministry. Now here's the shocker, and I remember reading something along these lines years ago. And uh, the first sentence of the book said something like, where you are in life, you chose to be. Mm -hmm. And that, as I got ready to read my decision to buy that book, I already bought it. The next sentence says, and you probably regret already you bought this book. <laughs> <laughs> but here is what I've discovered. We generally get what we want. Amen. The problem is we often don't want what we ought to want. Most of us desire comfort. And if your top desire is comfort, then you may want success, but not if it makes you uncomfortable getting it. So some people want it, but not as badly as they want to be comfortable. Most people in church want to see church growth. But not if it's going to require too much discomfort in the process of getting it. We want spiritual growth. But not if it's going to require too much praying time. Too much self-denial. If it makes me uncomfortable, I don't want it that bad. And Bill Bailey says, if you're casual about your goals, you will become a casualty. Mm -hmm. Jesus teaches through his word, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God can't be fooled. He know what you want based upon where you invest. Time, money, emotions, conversations. You invest in what you are passionate about. Amen. And if all of your time is spent talking about people, gossip, God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, that's what you're going to read. If you invest all your time in gossip, you will become a good gossiper. If you invest all your emotions and your mental time reflecting on what somebody did to you or what somebody said to you, you will become a professional mem memorizer of past events. Somebody tries to have a conversation with you and you will inevitably, inevitably go back to the past. All right, preacher. You start the conversation off with, God is good. Somebody says, oh, I want to talk to him. He surely is good. He good. He did this for me and he did that for me. And then you say, yeah, well, I had a whole lot of folk did this to me and did that to me, but, but I'm still trusting God. Like, okay, now you really just using God as a footnote. <laughs> you really talking about past events. And most people will talk about people, past events, or problems. 
And that's where they're passionate. And they end up getting more people doing the same thing, more present events that resemble past events, and more problems. And then if you come with a positive perspective on something, they just assume you're faking it. <laughs> and so if we get generally what we want, then we really have to look at what we're getting. And if what we're getting is not what we say we want, we really need to reevaluate what we really want. Right. Right. So do we really want church growth? Do we really want to see the kingdom expanded? Do we really want, first of all, spiritual growth personally? Because generally we get what we want. Earl Nightingale says that most of us are self-made men, but only the successful ones will admit it. And that's why community is so important. Because if the community defines mediocrity as success, then mediocrity will become comfortable. If the community says, we ain't trying to sound you know, choir wise, we ain't trying to sound like John P. Key and them. And you won't sound like it. <laughs> and that's that's why every time I stand to preach, no matter where the crowd is or how many are in the crowd, I do not try and determine how I preach based upon my assessment of who's there. Amen. Two hundred people. I'm gonna preach hard now. <laughs> oh, I ain't with twenty-five. I ain't gonna break no sweat. <laughs> I'm going to preach at a small church. I ain't spending no time preparing no sermon for them. That would be tragic. <laughs> but the idea is, whatever I do, whatever I do for God, yeah. I want to give Him my best. <laughs> And so then, this church has to develop the mindset that Kobe Bryant told to one of the young players at, for the Lakers when he was still playing ball. He said to him, the guy says, you know, Kobe had been my hero. I was looking forward to meeting Kobe. And he walked up to Kobe, and he said the first thing Kobe said was, over here we win championships. Set that standard now. Okay. And so 23rd Street has to be the kind of church with the mindset that I don't care how much education you got, I don't care how much money you got, over here we win championships. Amen. So ain't nobody going to come in here and you too good for us. Amen. We welcome the elite. We welcome the pauper. Amen. We welcome the educated, the uneducated. Everyone fits in because here we believe that we are God's children Amen. and because God made us and he doesn't make no junk, right. we are somebody. Yes. So when you come in here, don't come in here telling us what, what you accomplished and what you did to impress us. We are as impressive as you, and what makes us impressive is that we are blood-bought children of God. Amen. So we want to do things right when we're here. We want to do them in a way that represents God. That's the attitude that Solomon had uh, in building the temple. He wanted the temple to look like it was a place where God was. So we want to do ministry where it looks like God's ministry. We want everything we sing, say, and do to look like God has his fingerprints on it. And so all we have to do is just take our assets 
and utilize them for evangelism. Amen. It would really be easy for us to reach hundreds. Won't you say hundreds? Hundreds. This year, as a church, Amen. easy. If we don't do it, it's not because it's too hard. It's easy. If we don't do it, it's because not doing it is easier. Wow. Wow. All we have to do is take our assets and use them. If 200 people, that's human assets, reach just one this year, not by tomorrow, before December 31st, if 200 members would reach one person, that's 200 right there. Yeah. That's a human asset. If the transportation ministry, van and limousine, uses those vehicles as a marketing tool, easily they can reach, through transportation ministry, 25 people. Physical asset. SWAT ministry, prison, phone, door-to-door, -door, nursing home, etc. Easily, between now and December 31st, 300 people. Right. Youth and young adult ministry with graffiti faith, summer camp, exercise room, prayer retreat, a youth day, and our youth concert, things like that draw young folk. Easily 200 people. I've already talked about 725 people. Amen. Easily. Can you imagine if a percentage of them, say a little less than 50% of 725 that we reach, start coming here by January 1st? Amen. That's over 300 new members. Wow. Then you said those 300, well now, the 200 that reached 200. We want you to join us as we reach one apiece again. Now you got 500 reaching one. Next year you got 500 plus these other ministries. And I, there's so many other things that I haven't mentioned that we could do. So it can be done easily. It's just that not doing it comes easier. If we want it, though, we'll do it. When we create a culture that's inward focused, outward ministry seems scary. It's easy to do what you do around folk who already like you. Because if you mess up, they, they, you know, they're going to pardon you. One of the things that I learned years ago, I was preaching at the National Convention, and, and there was this nervousness because of all the folk. But fortunately, before I got up to preach, I started talking to some of them in the crowd and realized I knew several in the crowd, and then it clicked. All this is, is a gathering of the same kind of people, it's just more of them. All right. All right. So if you can do what you do in front of 12 people, when you get 1,200, it's just more of 12 people. But when you have an inward focus, then it's very easy to just try and keep it safe, Keep it like you are comfortable, so that if you keep it like you're comfortable, then what you do comes very easy. You're not uncomfortable. But if we have an evangelistic focus, an outward focus, then we'll embrace the challenge of doing ministry around people whom we have not met. And so then evangelism becomes the complete work of the church. 
that in everything we do, we are in one form or the other trying to reach somebody else. So that when resources come in, we're using resources to reach somebody else. And so we find ourselves not being uncomfortable, but embracing the challenge because we recognize that the challenge is an investment. And the worst thing that can happen is you learn from your mistakes. Right. Amen. And I said this, but I shouldn't have said that. I know next time. Because really, if you really want, all, all the successful economists will tell you, if you really want to be wealthy, solve problems. People pay you to solve problems. You're sick. You believe the doctor can solve your problem. You're paying. Your car won't start. You believe a mechanic can solve your problem. You're paying. You don't have no electricity in your house. You believe the power company can solve that problem. You're paying. And he just go on and on. Whatever your problem is, you pay for a solution. So what the church has to be busy doing is offering solutions. And the more solutions we provide, the more people will invest in us. And the more people invest in us, the more people we can solve whose problems we can solve. In times of deceit, the truth appears revolutionary. And so now we're living in a time of just complete deception. That's a problem. But if we go out and tell the truth, we're solving problems. And when we solve problems, people will invest in us. They're not doing us a favor. We're blessing them. If they're doing us a favor, then we're in trouble because when they get tired of doing us a favor, they're going to leave. Amen. Amen. Checked on a member just the other day. Hadn't seen this member in a while. Where have you been? I'm going through some things and, and, and uh, just kind of straight away from church. I'm like, you mean to tell me all the prayers that go on in 23rd Street, all the preaching and teaching that goes on in 23rd Street, you're going to leave church because you got a lot going on. Right. Explain that one to me. You've got problems. So come on over here. Somebody can help you solve that problem. And as a result, they're not doing us a favor by showing up. We are a blessing to them because we're offering to them a solution to that problem. Yeah, yeah. Every head is bowed, every eyes closed. Every person is just thinking about the eternal problem that God solved through Jesus. If you've accepted that solution, thank God for that solution. And then when you finish praying, you may stand.